Thank you. Um, good, listen and good evening, everybody. It, it was good to see some uh, older friends and, uh, uh, and also some representatives of the vibrant civil society community uh, in the Brighton area, um, and um, with whom I worked quite a lot, and I mentioned that, uh, the HIV AIDS Alliance, uh, very relevant for the, uh, the talk today. So what I thought doing was to start a little bit with uh, AIDS, how it was a really disruptive force, not only for people's lives, but also for institutions who had no clue how to to handle that, something new that nobody had planned for, as some senior international development uh, official told me um, when I said, why don't you do more? He said, we haven't planned for it. Um, <coughs> and, uh, so that's, uh, but then also going to uh, what I would say the, the current rhetoric and, uh, and some of the myths that, um, you know, about the end of AIDS and uh, uh, whether this is a, uh, an exit strategy of the U.S. or is this uh, real <coughs> or is it uh, an, another example of medical hubris? I mean, so that's the kind of things that I'd like to, um, to talk about and also to uh, support it with some, um, some evidence. And um, yeah, let me see. I intend to walk around, but I have to... Okay, yeah. <coughs> So, my, my own um, story in terms of AIDS starts actually in Kinshasa, uh, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Zaire, and um, where um, I went to see whether um, there were people with a disease that didn't have a name yet. Uh, AIDS was only, came up in 1984, something like that, and the cause of AIDS was only discovered in around that time. But uh, there was this new syndrome, and the dogma was that this is a gay disease. Because it was first described in um, the US and then here, and it was mostly in, in, in gay men. And um, it was probably caused by a virus, sexually transmitted. And I could never understand why a virus would care about the sexual orientation of a human host. <laughs> I thought that doesn't make sense because I always try to put myself in the skin, in the head of the others, you know, be it a microbe or someone I kind of dialogue with. And um, because what's the raison d'etre, what's the purpose in life of a virus, of a microbe? It's to have eternal life, I mean, it's to have a host that it needs to, uh, you know, to survive. And that means that the ability to jump from one host to another, be it uh, plants, be it animals or be it human primates like us, and that's what the sex between humans is from the perspective of life. It's not very romantic, but that's uh, what, it, uh, what it is about. So I said, you know, it doesn't make sense. And also, you know, um, the, uh, we were seeing, I was then uh, in Belgium and uh, seeing patients with uh, um, this new syndrome coming from Central Africa, and about one third were women. So that didn't match the gay disease thing. And, and actually which led to an awful term uh, in the beginning it was called great gay related immune deficiency a very stigmatizing type of uh, name for the disease and so um, you know when you have a problem or when you have a question it's always best to go and see there where you think uh, you know there, uh, it, you can find some answers so I went to Kinshasa where I worked before in the late 70s among the things were the, during the time of Ebola the first known Ebola outbreak. And so, yes, in the uh, largest, one of the largest public health hospitals in, in, in Africa, uh, called Mama Yemon these days, you know, after the, the name of Mobutu's mother, that's one of the observations in life I've made, is that dictators like to call things after their mother. So, usually hospitals or so. And um, yes, there was four of eight patients, and half of them were women. And, um, and I really walked there and what I thought, saw was this extreme poverty associated with this new disease, um, a huge gender element, actually the majority were women, and with young people. So I immediately started spinning in my hand and I said this is going to be a real uh, a catastrophe for, um, for that part of the world and, and that's what it has become. 
And so in no time, AIDS was first described in 1980, in June 1980, so um, you know, not that long ago and from a historic perspective, um, in no time it became the first cause of death in Africa. And here you see from the uh, global burden of disease exercise that from the, to the University of Washington in Seattle, and you can see here in terms of burden of disease, but also um, cause of death, that in sub-Saharan Africa, um, HIV is the single number one cause. Although that's not getting better, um, this is burden of disease, so that's uh, but uh, in terms of mortality, it's number one. But TB is now becoming um, uh, number one because we have it uh, antiretroviral therapy. Okay, of course, that is something I'm not supposed to do. But okay. Now, yeah. <coughs> from the beginning, um, AIDS was political, and there was a debate, what is this? Um, and the medical community said, of course, this is a viral illness. This is a... Um, a health problem as we've got so many infectious diseases. But there was a, um, someone, Jonathan Mann, who was a, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta in, in the US, and who became the founding director of the first global AIDS program, pro, uh, the special program on AIDS was called at the at WHO, when WHO got over its uh, denial. Um, mm -hmm. And he said, this is fundamentally a human rights issue because it affects those people whose rights are violated in some way or another. Because they're very poor, because they uh, you know, have different sexuality, um, because they're uh, using drugs, etc. And so that makes them so vulnerable that they're more um, at risk for HIV. But then a few years later, when um, starting in Japan and then later uh, particularly promoted by UNDP, um, that the concept of human security uh, became quite, um, you know, a, a new concept to look at um, poverty and other issues and bring together um, notions of economic development but also of uh, personal development, discrimination and so on. Human security um, and development issue were then an, another framework to define it. And then, unavoidably, in the U.S., uh, at the end of the millennium, uh, about everything was defined, and, and is defined again, um, as a security issue. Um, and so the National Intelligence Council um, published a report um, with um, you know, projections of uh, the cause of the epidemic that were uh, well inflated over what it would become. But it said this is a national security issue. Now, one thing I've learned is that after um, coming out of academia and going into the UN, and I thought if you have the evidence, you can, you know, that's that's good enough. In the end, I know that there are only two things that really um, can set an agenda uh, in, in, in a big way, and that is the economy and that security. So this security definition was interesting because that brought also aids to the um, you know, security council. So from human security to more classic type of uh, state security. Um, so these have been uh, four quite um, widely used um, frameworks, uh, conceptual frameworks of AIDS. And um, I would say that we are back to where we started. Today, we are back into the biomedical uh, model. And I think that's problematic. Um, AIDS was highly disruptive uh, in the development world. And the first reaction was denial, as usually when there's bad news. And um, one of my favorite books is uh, La Peste from, uh, by Albert Camus, The Plague. And uh, he describes when the pest, when the plague hits uh, Oran in Algeria, uh, how um, the total denial doesn't exist. Second phase is that, yeah, it's there, but it's the others. It's only later that we, as part of us. And so in the beginning, it was total rejection. Also here at the at IDS, uh, uh, in circles, in DFID, in UNICEF, in WHO. Um, and I can understand because it was disruptive, but nobody knew is this um, a very short-lived type of thing, or is this a fundamental issue? Um, 
And uh, sometimes I went to extreme levels, like um, President Becky in South Africa, who flatly denied that HIV existed, who thought that this was a conspiracy of the West or of the pharmaceutical industry, um, and thereby blocked the uh, access to uh, antiretroviral therapy, first to prevent monotone child transmission and then to save millions of its citizens. So the beginning years, the early years were really, uh, as far as the experts are concerned, um, was a lot of time was spent on saying why this is not important. And I remember that DFET was organizing workshops why it is really not possible and not a good idea to introduce antiretroviral therapy in low-income countries because it's not sustainable, it's not a public good, uh, it doesn't fit, you know, it's not pro poor and all these arguments that you could, all of us could say, rather than to organize workshops to say how are we going to save these people's lives. So that's what it was, I found it always uh, very interesting, the, the inability of institutions to deal with something that is not there. And I think we're going through the same thing in a much bigger and broader way with Trump coming around and just, it's, it's also disruption. All these experts and institutions have forgotten one thing, and that is people. They had forgotten people, and they had forgotten that um, this is a, a disease that um, is affecting young people, young adults, not sure, but young adults, and in many countries also middle class. It, it does affect the poor, but it affects the rich because it's about sex. And uh, in early days, in many countries, it was actually the higher your income, the more likely it is that you had HIV. That was documented in, from Thailand to uh, countries in, in, in Africa. Now it's the other way around. Um, and, um, and it was often richer, older men and poor, younger women. Um, but it was not counting with you know, these people that they had a voice, and they were fighting for their lives. And that's what happened in the West, with ACT UP and so on, you know, but in every country from Brazil and uh, take South Africa, which is the country that is today has six and a half, seven billion people living with HIV, can you imagine? Um, and, um, and in the 80s, had hardly any HIV. That's a pretty late um, invasion in the sense of the virus. And when you would come from the moon, or where you would not know what the world is, and you give this to one of these, uh, to a student in development, you know, you ask, what does treatment action campaign activists, the Anglican Church, the Communist Party, the uh, unions, the COSATO, um, you know, the Chamber of Mines, a UN organization, uh, MSF, the Sense of Frontier Academics, what do they have in common? Absolutely nothing. Except around AIDS, they formed a college. They put their differences aside. Also, because they were united, because the government, under the um, leadership of Mbeki, was not willing to recognize that fact and to act while people were dying. So it's this kind of brilliant coalition. The, the word brilliant coalition I picked up from a book called Bury the Chains from uh, Adam Moksha. A brilliant book uh, on how, um, in what is that now? That's more than 200 years ago, uh, there was a real civil society movement um, that was organized in this country for the abolition of slavery at a time when um, communication was well, pigeons and horses were probably the fastest way. And yet, there was a movement that was spread not only here in Britain but also outside. And there was a coalition and so on led by the Quakers and, and I thought this is like what we saw and what we've seen in, um, you know, in um, South Africa and other countries. Um, so the, um, the battle to say so moved from the technical debate to uh, the political um, space and that's what made a difference. And that political space became that from the community action and so on um, to the uh, multilateral political space, the UN, uh, 
first session ever of the UN, of the UN Security Council on, um, on a health issue, on actually a non-classic um, security issue, and it was the first meeting of the uh, new millennium on the 10th of January, and was chaired by then um, Vice President Gore, Al Gore from the US, um, because the US had a, the chair of the Security Council. The Security Council has a different chair, it's rotating chair every month. And the one thing that a chair can do is to uh, set some agenda items. Um, so between Christmas and New Year, I'd be working with Ambassador uh, Holbrook and to, you know, to put uh, that on the agenda, uh, which nobody really wanted because it was not so classic. But that made a big difference. Um, High-level meeting, um, etc. Uh, Nelson Mandela came out, which is interesting. His first speech on AIDS was not in South Africa, it was in Davos, at the World Economic Forum. And then he uh, you know, came out in South Africa and one of his sons actually died from AIDS, with him in the gates and, and so on. And then it became like quite a high society type of thing. But each country had to go through something. Um, and uh, for me a turning point was uh, in Abuja at the, um, the African Union. Uh, then chaired by uh, President Obasanjo from Nigeria in 2001, in April, hosted a special summit on this. And uh, what was uh, very interesting, even you can look at it from a psychoanalytic perspective, is that one president after the other could say the AIDS word and said, yes, we have a problem. Because if you can't say that you have a problem, then you will never go for a solution. Everybody except one president back. And um, so this, and then this uh, in China, you had to go through the Communist Party, etc., etc. But all this came together with some technical game changers. So when you see how the, um, a social movement and a, um, a new issue can um, really develop uh, in a big way so that there is change, um, on, we had a combination of um, technical breakthroughs as a result of science, of research, um, the development of treatment, um, so that AIDS was no longer a death sentence and you could still, uh, you know, if you give three different drugs, you could stay alive for the quality of life, etc. Although there are major problems, but still. Um, prevention of mother to child transmission was very important also that that was possible because um, here we could go for a quite a classic type of um, public health uh, intervention. But what made a real difference were the political events. UNGAS is the acronym for UN General Assembly Special Session on AIDS where 45 um, heads of state uh, came and said yes, this is what we commit to and an agreement on some targets and all that stuff. And, uh, and that was also part of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And then the creation of dedicated uh, funding streams, uh, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, but also TB and malaria, so that was collateral benefits. And um, in 2003, President George Bush uh, took everybody by surprise by asking US Congress for $15 billion. Uh, we were very happy in these days if it was $100 million more, or less, and suddenly we moved from the M word to the B word. Billions, and that's what's needed. So this is um, it's kind of a bit of the history since I see so many young people here, which is great. And at the same time, there were big fights going on that also, I think, are very important for the broader development agenda. One was that we had this innovation in new drugs, new, new therapy coming out uh, in 96. And here in the UK, uh, this was announced in July and in September, uh, people living with HIV and uh, could get this therapy through the NHS. Because we have this system here and, uh, and in, some, in other European countries as well. The rest of the world was a bit problematic. In the sense that this was costing 14,000 US dollars per person per year. Far too high for most people in the world. Either because they are too poor, the countries are too poor, there's no health coverage and so on. So this became quite an obsession to uh, decrease the price, the cost of these drugs, so that they would become available to people 
would who need it, because by that time there were about 20 million people in need. Um, and to make a long story short, this happened after um, quite a while. You see here the, the story for Uganda from 12,000 in 1998, and now the, basically the same drugs are available for about $300 per person per year. In other words, less than a dollar per day. Um, that was the result of activism, diplomacy, changing the rules of the game. Like, um, I had no clue about TRIPS, and you know, I'd never heard of it when I was in the job, but uh, Carlos, you know all that, but there's a trade-related intellectual property uh, rules, um, so which made that it, uh, if you make a copy of a drug, a so-called generic drug, um, you're, and that's made in India, as so most of them are, um, you can't really import that in a third country and without certain rules. So we could make an exception. We obtained an exception in 2002 or 2003 in Doha at one of the World Trade Organization uh, trade negotiations so that there is a public health exception. I always say, I don't want to change everything, just do it for, for AIDS. But that was the trick to, you have your foot in the door and then you can open other things. That's the way to do it. Um, and so, it was also uh, the arrival on the uh, global market of Indian generic manufacturers, also because the trade laws, the intellectual property laws, sorry, in India changed. Um, so it was, I must say, um, a, uh, the stars were becoming aligned, um, and, and I'm not sure that would happen again very easily. But this was the first time that a technological innovation that's still under patent even today became fairly rapidly available also to the poor, thanks to these new mechanisms. And when today a big company, Pharma, puts a new uh, anti-HIV drug on the market, there is nearly always differential pricing for low-income countries, high-income countries, middle-income countries, uh, licensing, etc., uh, etc. Et so that is, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, AIDS has been a pathfinder. But even if something costs only a dollar a day, someone still has to pay for it. And so that, um, I mentioned, you know, the Global Fund was created, um, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS relief, as it's called in the US, etc. And you see a spectacular increase in funding for HIV, international uh, funding and domestic. Also because the economy was on the rise and international development envelopes and budgets were also on the rise, so we didn't have to take it away from uh, other budgets. All this um, led to some results, fortunately, which is not something we can always say in development. Um, and here, first of all, the indicator is that um, in 2000, uh, about uh, 200,000 people were on antiretroviral therapy in low mid income countries. Half of them were in Brazil, at least half were in Brazil, and, uh, and then some wealthy individuals. And this went up, uh, particularly after 2005, and now we're at the moment at about 21, 22 million in 2017. The, the, the new estimates will come out actually tomorrow uh, from uh, UNAs. Um, so that's a, a quite a spectacular program. And, and this is something that, um, uh, you know, there are books that are written about it, why it's impossible to provide this kind of therapy in low-income countries. Um, and it went very far. The administrator of USAID, the head of USAID, at some point said, even, oh, Africans don't have watch, they don't have a notion of time, so they can't take this kind of drugs. So uh, going close to, if not totally, into racism. Um, but it was really uh, an incredible conspiracy to keep this, uh, you know, um, life-saving therapies from people. Um, and that resulted in declining mortality, um, in new infections, and this is for Sub-Saharan Africa, so real, uh, real results. Now, this has given rise to some kind of euphoria. Um, it took, first of all, quite far too long to get there, um, and uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and, and, and human lives. But now the rhetoric of the UN and of uh, the US, the two dominant forces here, um, are that the end of AIDS is in sight. 
we have the Millennium Development Goals, eh, that it's a Coquilla of development, and that it says, uh, um, and one of the goals is that by 2030, um, there will be an end to the AIDS epidemic. Will be done. also a few other things, but let's just concentrate on, on AIDS. And, um, and that has been a mantra from, uh, you see, President Obama, but also the uh, you know, the UNAIDS, and, uh, um, and it has been hammered as the rhetoric, the end is in sight, which I think now has become rather counterproductive and it's actually not supported by the facts, even if we have made enormous progress. Now, four years ago, when there was the uh, 10th anniversary, 10th? 20th, sorry, anniversary of the HIV AIDS Alliance, Brighton, and um, was asked to give a speech, and to be honest, I didn't know very well what to say. I was, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and then I thought about it, you know, I was getting very worried about this kind of euphoric type of discourse, and I, and I still travel around and talk to people and see, and I said, but what I'm seeing doesn't correspond to what, you know, what, some, uh, what the, uh, you know, the official rhetoric is. And so I said, here, my 10 myths are about AIDS, and uh, I'll say a bit more about that. So, first myth is that the end is in sight. Well, we'll see it, come back to that. Second myth is that all we need is some pills. We're going to fix this epidemic with some pills. ART means antiretroviral therapy. Three is that an, a whole um, attack, basically, from the medical community that behavior interventions, that anything that's not a pill doesn't work and that there's no evidence for that. Four is that, um, another myth is we just, since it's all about therapy, we integrate this into health services and in the, you know, universal health coverage and all that. Fifth is that the epidemic, uh, all we need to do is to just do more of the same and it will go wrong, because that's what mathematical modeling are showing us, um, kind of assuming that uh, we're robots and not just people with this no sex driving, so. Six, oh, there's something went wrong here. Uh, but anyway, six, um, that, um, why bother about, you know, all these uh, kind of difficult characters in civil society, we don't need that, it's, we will fix these three positions. Seven myth, and that's coming particularly from the US and the UN, and it's part of an exit strategy for uh, not having to spend international development money, and that is that domestic funding will cover all the coast. Now, we have quite some good evidence that in some of the poorest countries in Africa, we would have to spend up to 4 or 5% of their GDP per year just for, to keep uh, some of their people with HIV alive. They can't do it. So we need... Then we, can do, we can't do better with current funding. That's also like, sometimes coming from civil society. No, we can have efficiency. There is a lot of wastage. Finally, also stigma and discrimination, and it's a hope that I also had, which has been so false, fearful with the fearful with the HIV that when there is a condition becomes treatable, the stigma is gone and the discrimination will be gone. And that was a total, I mean, that was an error, that was a mistake. It has not happened. Because it's about something else. It's about sexuality, it's about being different. It's pretty, and, uh, and lastly, uh, this is about funding for vaccines. So, a few words on the, where are we? Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, I come from the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, one of the temples of epidemiology, so uh, bear with me. But you see, a, in blue, is a decline of new infections. And that started actually uh, already in the 90s, as a result of um, very basic uh, interventions, so condom use and immunity mobilization. There were no drugs. Mortality, that declined in 2005. But we have now cumulatively about 35 million uh, deaths from HIV and about 1 million deaths a year. That means that by 20, let's say 30 plus, we'll have as many people killed by HIV as by the Spanish flu. I mentioned the Spanish flu because this year is the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu, which killed more people than in World War I. And also, unfortunately, people who are men, who are 
survived the trenches and uh, got through all this, these horrors, and then a few months later they were killed by a stupid virus. So we are not there yet. Um, and there are a few regions that are particularly uh, problematic. And one is close to here, and that is Eastern Europe. And HIV in Eastern Europe is uh, completely due that, that it's getting out of control because of a failure of policy and politics. And because particularly in Russia and some of the ex-Soviet uh, states are refusing to face a few things. One, that uh, injecting drug use is rampant. It's a huge problem of drug use. And that you can actually do something about that. There are ways that are scientifically proven from needle exchange to reduce the, the risk to, um, you know, substitution therapy, etc., etc. But that's absolutely verboten. And um, personally, when I was head of UNAIDS, I went so many times, and it, I, it, I felt as a person of failure, I could not convince him. And you see what's happening, it's really getting out of control. <coughs> uh, in a country that's also very interesting, like Russia is, um, the population of Russia is declining by about 200 to 300,000 people a year. There's a demographic deficit, fertility rates are low and so on. Um, and it comes to that. Plus, there's enormous discrimination, access to treatment um, for uh, drug uses, for gay men, and so on. It's really and then we've got Southern Africa, where you could say it's hyper-endemic, where that's the part of the world where I would say that HIV is and has become a true development issue, because it's affecting uh, many ways of society, but societies that are also adapting. Um, these are fairly old figures, but nothing has changed, unfortunately. This is from a rural uh, Kozuna Natal, and uh, rural, where you can see that the incidence, in other words, the the, the, the risk of new infections per year for young women, well, it's between 4 and 9% per year. It was like that in, 19, uh, in 2017. It's not gone down. So by the time you're like 30 years old as a woman, it's like 40% IHIV positive. So the end of age is not for them. And Science Magazine, the, um, you know, from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, has a special cover on AIDS uh, two weeks ago, and it shows where um, it's comparing Nigeria, Russia, and then US, Florida particularly, and South Africa, and it shows how in many of these countries, uh, take particularly Nigeria, Russia, and some parts of the US, there's a, a still a huge problem, and also a failure of policy and of access. Um, so it's really, uh, in the first place, I would say that on the one hand, our tools are imperfect because they are technical tools and, uh, and it's about people and their, you know, their, their circumstances or their environment, cultural and development. Um, but also it's ideology and it's uh, um, because when you see that 44% of all new infections are in what the UN, with some word that I find horrible, calls key populations. Uh, always, it's people who are at high risk for many reasons, that for of HIV. And uh, when you take, uh, uh, what, what does that mean? It's um, men of sex with men in many societies completely illegal, so you can't reach and all that, discriminated. Uh, migrants, um, it's uh, sex workers, drug users, but also um, women in general, but particularly adolescent girls, and um, where you see when you look into intimate partner violence playing a big role. And one thing that we, uh, we should bear in mind for not only for HIV but for in general in development is that Africa is on the way for, uh, of the largest cohort in its history of young people. Now, that in, in Asia that was, there was an enormous dividend to it because <coughs> states and households, families invested massively in education of their children and there was also the economic boom and so on. In Africa, I don't see that. And uh, I think we're going for a time bomb, a political time bomb, well, when we have uh, a massive a number of uh, young boys, men and women, without a job and so on, education, what are they 
do. Um, immigration pressure on Europe will increase. Um, and then from a, a health perspective, this is going to create uh, quite some challenges. And how to you know, turn that into a dividend, like in, in uh, uh, Africa, I think is one of the biggest challenges that African leaders have today. Um, but I don't see uh, that there is a very proactive policy there. Um, and these are, you know, some projections are uh, it's difficult to predict the future, but this is very simple to do because it's people who are already there today, they're born. Um, and then when you see it, so it's a bit complicated, but it is the new infections in these uh, HIV infections in adolescent boys and girls are really high, particularly in, um, in, in girls, and uh, they have less access to therapy and so on. But that's an insect. But we have also an interesting and paradoxical uh, effect, uh, gender uh, effect. And that is that in general, certainly in Africa, that um, women have more in, uh, access to antiretroviral therapy than men. That's probably one of the few examples. And this is partly the fact that um, they, you know, during pregnancy, that uh, women are screened for HIV. So, and there are more programs that are directed there, and men don't come for medical care. In other parts of the world, it's not exactly the same thing. But that's a, uh, I find an interesting uh, paradox. Now, we've known for years that uh, about so-called risk factors. You know, again, in epidemiology, there's a talk about risk factors, which has a very limited usefulness in, in real life, but it makes analysis very easy. But when you go into a broader uh, development context, um, there are what we call in the, in the structural drivers of HIV, but there are also structural drivers of many other issues. Gender inequality and violence, poverty and livelihood, stigma and criminalization. We added here also alcohol. This is from a program that's uh, coordinated out of the London School of Hygiene Medicine by Charlotte Watson. Uh, she started to do that. And um, so we're not going to fix this epidemic with pills as long as we also haven't addressed some of the, the basic drivers that make that societies are having these problems. And, this, and, uh, and then it's a bit like uh, other things in, with the uh, antiretroviral therapy 20 years ago. They said, yeah, okay, it's fine, you know, I know beating your wife is bad and there's violence and so on, but sorry, but there's nothing we can do about it. That is kind of the, what you hear also. And we know that you can do something about it. You can interfere with this, you know, from education, that which is not in there, but, um, and uh, we, we, we now have some firm evidence that you can actually prevent intimate partner violence and so on. And one of the, the mistakes we've made, perhaps, well, many of the gender issues is that we only work with women and forget that certainly when it comes to violence, it's not the women who initiate the violence, so we need to work with men. So this is kind of a, a, a cumulative evidence that um, it doesn't work, and, uh, but it's all fairly small scale. Stigma discrimination, um, just like uh, look at the, the this is a the homophobic climate index, is a um, um, one of the indexes that exist. Um, it is everywhere nearly, but it can be particularly bad in some countries. And it's interesting that in the New York Times a couple of days ago, um, Larry Kramer, who's one of the pioneers uh, and, uh, in the band Played On, um, book in the, in, the, in the gay AIDS movement in New York, is still alive, which is kind of a miracle. Um, and um, and he says with the Trump administration, with what's going on in the world, he say, um, this is his words, for gays the worst is yet to come again. We have to come back to the streets. And I think that's true in many, many uh, uh, countries, um, but even here. Um, and when you see that um, how criminalization of same-sex activity um, really uh, kills people. and. Uh, I don't have the time to go into detail, but it sees in red you see countries that are, uh, where same-sex activity is criminalized, and uh, if this is just an ecological correlation, but the, the HIV prevalence is always higher. And then finally, um, we, there is a decline in funding 
First, this is from uh, the latest figures from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and uh, they report on, uh, on financing global health, but it's, they're also global development and some international funding. And so after <coughs> the booming years between uh, 2000 to about 2012, where we see every year an increase, particularly in the US, uh, that uh, funding is now uh, going down. And when you look at just that HIV, it's, uh, it is going down also in a, in a way. Now, you could argue that perhaps too much money went to HIV compared to other things. My answer has always been everything should be funded and not just uh, HIV. Now, this is going to be uh, hitting uh, Africa particularly badly. And um, it's, sorry for the complicated uh, account. My finger is not long enough to go this button. It, it is really a uh, dependency of um, international assistance is certainly true in the low-income countries in Africa, where it's about 40% the AIDS response. So that is a big issue. Activism is going down, and uh, that's another issue. So uh, we are still trying to find, um, you know, the magic bullet, and that is the, uh, at the moment, the strategy is treat and then you prevent. And it's true, if you treat someone, you know, the virus is suppressed and you're less infectious. But it, it's not enough. So you need really the behavioral, the biomedical and the structural interventions all are coming together. And as uh, to quote a famous uh, philosopher, um, belongs in the dustbin of history, the simple, um, the one single bullet, magic bullet. So what we need now is to move it, just like in development, we have the acute crisis, we need to have the, you know, to take care of people's needs, but we also need a long-term view. And that's where AIDS has become, from an emerging disease, an epidemic, you know, like Ebola and so on, just acute, has become endemic. In other words, it's in societies, and we should think about societies living with HIV just as living with other things. But the question is, what level is acceptable? And so, the, a, a book was published uh, several years ago, and, um, you know, taking the long-term view, but it was not very popular. Um, but now, it's, you know, it's clear that we have to take this uh, long-term view, which brings it much closer to development. Take one example. Here you see the dependency of several African countries for foreign aid for the treatment of the people living with HIV. In other words, the survival, the daily survival of millions of people today depends on the vote in the US Congress and on the whatever different will give and the Global Fund and so on. Can you call these countries still sovereign? The largest um, HIV treatment program in the world is in South Africa with about 4 million people. But there, the government pays for it uh, itself. So these are some questions that come up. So next week is the big international AIDS conference in, in Amsterdam. And um, lots of thousands of people come there. And uh, a report will be published, uh, uh, released on Thursday. I'm co-thrown in by the Lancet with the International AIDS Society. And um, these are some of the key messages. And the first one is really is that um, we're not on track to end the AIDS epidemic. So let's get real. Um, and the rhetoric of the, the end of AIDS may have been counterproductive. Uh, although I understand why it is. Um, but uh, it's a bit like health for all by the year 2000. And in the end, you know, the credibility goes down. So, we have to be careful when we set targets, and uh, and all countries, member states of the UN have signed up to the SDGs. But when you start looking at it, and you go into some detail, and you say, "What have they been smoking?" You know, when they sign this, because so many things are going to be eliminated by 2030, and we, I think, any reasonable person knows that it's not possible, and that's not because we are incompetent and so on, because we have a very complex problem. So HIV is in that. So we need to, to reboot the global effort, but also it has to be far more integrated into the broader development efforts. Um, that's where the SDGs are a, a good framework, also with human rights, a series about prevention, 
and uh, we have to get clear that it's a long-term challenge. And finally, um, I would say and argue that um, this AIDS epidemic and AIDS response really uh, engendered what we call today global health. It's a term that didn't exist last century. We were still tropical medicine and so on, like our school, but that's, uh, you know, that's a legacy of the colonial past. Um, global health is about, you know, far more is broader and uh, it connects health and development. Um, it's multidisciplinary. Um, you know, the divide between prevention and treatment, the advocacy and activism, the people's voice, global funding, um, breaking through these um, obstacles of access to essential products, and um, that are still under patent, human rights there, and it will provide a major boost. So this is a bit of the story, and so the question, uh, are, we, are we there, is the end there? The answer is no, but we've made good progress, and. I think the way now is to connect far more with the broader development agenda, with um, you know, and continuing to, uh, in a sense, for me, to use AIDS as a pathfinder to innovate in um, you know in society, um, so that um, we can accelerate uh, all the uh, you know strategies to reach the, the SDGs. So uh, this is the advertisement, so for those that were going into more detail. Thank you very much.